Thank you. So this webinar is recorded and will be available on Rafi's website and our YouTube page. So this event is the third in a webinar series. We've covered an introduction to NRCS as well as soil conservation on cropland. So we started broadly uh, discussing how NRCS as a program works and the different initiatives within NRCS and how farmers can work really well with this program and also some of the challenges they have historically experienced. And then um, we, we took a closer look uh, with cropland producers with soil conservation on cropland. Both of these webinars are available on our website and that we highly recommend that you check those out. So to begin, um, we're here today thinking about healthy grazing land. And so I want you to visualize something with me for a moment. What do you visualize when I say healthy grazing land? What does it look like? Are you in the woods or on open pasture? What does the soil underfoot feel like? What does um, it smell like? What happens when it rains? And what happens to it when it hasn't rained for over a week? So we're, we're here today on this topic because soil is the foundation for our farms. It's soil health and the health of other resources like water, air, energy, plants, animals, even humans, they're independent of one another and we depend on these interconnections of these resources in order for our farms to thrive. So when you think about RAPI's program, Resource for Resilient Farms, what new meaning does this name take on for you today? The quality of our resources really make our farms um, healthy, but also easily bounce back in times of adversity and in a time where we're experiencing increased storms and the effects of those storms, this kind of bounce back effect is, is more important than ever. So our, our project at RAPI is meant to deliver resources like knowledge, but also to support you with the infrastructure and the technical and financial assistance that supports this farm resilience. And Today, we're not only sharing information about conservation of natural resources, but we want to make sure that the means to this con conservation is accessible, especially to new and beginning farmers, farmers of color, veterans, women, and those with limited income. Go ahead and click through, Carolina. And so this is a diagram to just demonstrate how all of these resources stand out alone and they work in coordination with one another. So go ahead and click through those. Um, briefly, a little bit about soil function. Um, because it's going to be the foundation of our grazing land health, we want to note that soil has to serve um, a few primary functions. And so to go through them one by one, it's regulating water, it's sustaining plants and animal life, that's wildlife and our livestock, it's filtering and buffering pollutants, which could include animal waste or other chemical inputs. It needs to function as a nutrient cycling um, physical matter, and it's providing physical stability and support, which is directly correlated to our livestock health. And NRCS is an incredible resource, um, often underutilized. And the NRCS, if you click to the next slide, um, can support a variety of functions on your farmland. So whether you're producing crops, livestock, if you are a timber land or wild land owner, there's a variety of um, programs and services that can specifically help you address one or multiple of these areas on your farm. And to briefly review one of these programs, the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, 
Um, you'll see information on the slide and we dive more deeply into the EQUIP program in our introduction to NRCS webinar, but EQUIP provides both financial and technical assistance to producers. And it's meant to help you address natural resource concerns or the problems on your farmland, as well as deliver the environmental benefits by applying one or more practices in a set amount of time. It's a voluntary program and the financial assistance is a cost share which means you have to remember that you are going to be responsible for at least a portion of the cost of making these environmental improvements. Um, advanced payments are available for these practices that you might implement. And historically underserved producers, which includes farmers of color, would receive higher financial assistance, anywhere between 75 to 90%. So it can be a significant relief of the cost burden of making these improvements. And it's our taxpayer dollars at work. The second program is the Conservation Stewardship Program. Um, this is meant to help farmers, producers build on existing conservation efforts they have in place while strengthening their operations. Contracts can be longer than with the EQUIP program. And you can choose anywhere from you know, one to several enhancements to address the concerns also on your farmland. On the following slide, there's some examples of CSP related to not just livestock operations, but other operations as well. And we have the privilege of two farmers joining us today who have a breadth of experience with the CSP program, and, and we'll hear from them shortly. So NRCS, they want to primarily improve soil and other resource health. And they operate on the basis of principles of soil health. And so everything that NRCS would want you to achieve on your farmland is based on these principles and the improvements that you seek to make um, have to um, improve one or more or all of these principles. Um, on the next slide, I want to take it a little bit um, deeper to grazing specific principles, um, which this is from the Noble Research Institute. Um, and two things that I want to use to kind of bookend NRCS's soil health principles are these two points. One is know your context. And number six is integrating livestock appropriately. So knowing your context means that you have been, you know, a steward of your land historically, you know your land better than anyone else, and you are seeking practices and improvements that are going to be contextualized to your physical place. Because what works for you in Georgia isn't necessarily going to work for you or another farmer in Puerto Rico. Um, and then what works on your farm might not actually work on your neighbor's farm right down the street due to waterways on property lines, um, other drainages, and the animals in these different systems. Um, and then the next point about integrating livestock appropriately, we can take this one step further because there's five kind of fundamentals um, when, we, when we seek to make when we seek to achieve these overall soil health principles, there's, there's five ways that we can either jeopardize our operations or improve them. So of this list, there is the timing. So like when our grazing occurs and the frequency, how often these plants and forages are grazed, the intensity to which they're grazed, the duration or how long that grazing period last in a particular spot. And then the rest are recovery time. How long do those plants have to kind of regrow, bounce back before that next herd is coming over this place? And so depending to, on the degree to which we are um, observing and wanting to improve these five fundamentals, you know, we may be improving our grazing, grazing systems or we may be jeopardizing them. Um, so we're going to begin now turning this over to Chris and Burnell Muse from Muse 3 Farm. Y'all take it away, introduce yourselves, and we look forward to your presentation. All right. Well, thank you, Jamie, and thank you, Rafi, for inviting us uh, to this uh, presentation. Uh, 
Just to give you a little bit about ourselves, we are Muse 3 Farm. Uh, I am Chris Muse. I'm the project manager for the firm. Uh, we also have Bernal on as well. Bernal was a former NRCS agent, and he also has worked uh, his past five years. He just recently retired in March from Southern University as our area agent here for the parish as well. Uh, just a little bit quickly about Muse 3 Farm. You see, it was established in 2015. In 2015, I was still in Atlanta, Georgia. I was a project manager in Atlanta, Georgia. Bernal was still working at that time in RCS. And we have two other co-founders, so it's four of us brothers, and they were in Texas. So we, other than purchasing land, we did not get a lot done until 2019. So that's when I say Muse 3 Farms started taking office in 2019. We decided, you know, we cannot do this long distance. We need to move back home. So we moved back to our family home uh, and, and our family place in Greensburg, Louisiana, and we started purchasing property. And that's what we use as the foundation of Muse 3 Farm. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Carolina. So uh, when we started really in 2018, one of our goals was we wanted to sort of be a working farm where we can showcase things with the other farmers, students, uh, anybody within our area. We wanted to educate them on uh, good soil health concepts, uh, good conservation strategies. Uh, we wanted to show our farmers, you know, hey, uh, there are partners out there who work with the local NRCS, uh, USD agencies, uh, county agencies, universities. So we started our forum, we said, okay, let's set it up where we can bring in and we can train and educate others as well. So our farm is comprised of 206 acres. Uh, interesting, 40 of those acres were timberland. So in 2018, that, that 40 acres was owned by a timber company. They cut the timber, they sold us that farmland. We've converted that to uh, pasture land. Uh, we was able to purchase 60 acres that had been in pasture land from our uncle. Uh, we have another 43 acres that we purchased that we are uh, using an equip contract. We planted that back in longleaf pine. And the goal is to eventually allow the animals to graze that once those trees become of age. Uh, and we have 63 acres right now that's in lop lolly pine. So we have 206 acres that we're focusing on. Our cattle are using about, a, our animals are using about a hundred of those acres. Uh, we have cattle, goats, sheep, chickens on our, uh, on our pasture land today. And I gave you the volumes there. So we try to create an environment where we focus first on the soil. If we have healthy soil, that should lead to healthy animals and that should lead to healthy humans. Okay. Uh, so our strategy, you know, rotation of grazing, uh, we wanted to divide that land up so that we could allow uh, the, uh, the soil to rest. So we uh, divided that 100 acres up into 10 different paddocks. We also do multi-species grazing. And, and what I mean about that, we allow all of our animals, our cattle, our goats, our sheep, and even our chickens to roam across multiple of these paddocks together. So you will see, uh, you know, on our farm, you would see animals, sheep and goats roaming with our cattle on, on a daily basis. Each of our paddocks is gonna have either a pond or a creek or a fresh uh, source of water. We try to have a fresh water supply in each paddock. We just have some that's uh, uh, further back that we have not been able to put a fresh uh, uh, water supply in, but the majority of those also has a fresh uh, su a supply of water as well. Okay, CSP, Conservation Stewardship Program. So first of all, if, if, if you're not familiar with that program, I would say get familiar with it. it. It is a great way to help you, assist you with finding conservation activities that's gonna benefit you, it's gonna benefit your soil, it's gonna benefit your animals. It's, it's a win-win proposition. Uh, there are many uh, programs out there on, on, on the CSP. Uh, we right now have implemented uh, four of those 
as part of our practices. And most of those has been since 2018, 2019. Uh, so working and partnering with our local agent, uh, we, you know, we requested those guys that came out to our farm. They did a site visit. We walked them through what we was trying to do. Uh, and based upon that, we were able to put together a plan. And these are some of the uh, practices that we decided that we would implement as part of our farm. So it was the uh, practice herbertial weed treatment. You know, we want to make sure that we control the weeds, you know, we want to be able to control it in, in more of a, um, a normal way, not with a bunch of uh, herbicides. Uh, conservation, monarch butterflies, you know, we hadn't really thought about that until we talked with our agent and said, okay, let's make sure our farm can not only sustain our animals, but let's help bring back the monarch butterfly. So we implemented uh, an activity, especially for that. Nutrient management is very, very important. You know, uh, our goal is to one day be 100% uh, off of synthetic uh, fertilizer. So how are you going to do that? You know, you've got to be controlled with the health of your soil, uh, the, uh, the natural byproducts that come from your animals. So we wanted to work and put that practice in place. And also then integrated pest management. How do we control the pest uh, within, the, uh, within our farm? So those are the activities that we have implemented right now on our grazing land. <laughs> you know, there, there are a ton more that uh, NRCS offers. I do uh, implore you, and I think William's gonna talk about it later, but they, there's a website out there that explains all of their uh, programs that they offer. So let's just kind of do a little better deep dive into our programs. So when we work with uh, NRCS with the weed treatment, uh, we, we did the activity and they have uh, different activities on each of those uh, practices, but we wanted to make sure we could control our weeds on our, on our, on our property. Now, it's pretty easy to implement the, the uh, activities, I, I, in my opinion. So for us, our plan in order to uh, meet this, uh, act, uh, this practice uh, we control our weeds by multi-species grazing. So our goats, sheep, sheep, and chickens control a lot of the weeds that are in our pasture land. We also do periodic bush hogging. So like after every third rotation of our animals in and out of our paddocks, we do a light bush hogging to also help control uh, the weeds. And we do, uh, Early on, as part of our fence line control and around our wooded vegetation area, we did do a light application of RM43 to control, uh, control vegetation around those areas, so weeds. So it's pretty simple. I mean, it's not a lot. If you can see, these are things we probably would have had, had to do anyhow. So why not get uh, the expertise and experience and some of the uh, cost sharing opportunities that NRCS provide to help do those things. And it's only going to make our farm even better and e even more profitable. All right, next slide. So just wanted to put in a few visuals. Uh, so this is, this is our land. Uh, so you can see we have our sheep and uh, goats and cattle all roaming together. Uh, the, it's amazing the job that those animals do to keep control of the weeds. Uh, we do not spray any uh, herbicides on our pastures. Uh, we let the goats in the bush off and control that. Next slide. So this was one after a light bush hogging, you know, so if you look out, you know, you see, our, I call it a pristine pasture. I don't see any, any weeds growing within the pasture. And this is one that we took at, taken in the, in the fall as uh, we moved into our ryegrass season. So all of that we controlled uh, via, via that plan, the activity plan from CSP. Okay. Conservation plan 327, establish a monarch butterfly habitat. So we was talking about our agent. They said, hey, you guys, you know, when they looked at our uh, fields and our structure and the layout, you know, we had some areas that they said, this would be a good location for you guys to look at planning some things to help uh, establish this habitat. So working with them again, uh, we located some areas within the property that we could plant mitweed 
along our field borders to help bring back the uh, monarch butterfly. So at, with that practice, there was basically two things that we had to show. You know, we had to show our prep work and the actual planting of those, uh, the milkweed. So next slide, Carolina. So that's my brother Bernal. We were out that day. You know, we went around our field. Uh, we, 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 we looked at where we wanted to plant the milkweed. We wanted to put it in the area, you know, that was not conducive to a lot of animal foot traffic. So we basically went out with our trusted post hole digger. We uh, dug some holes and we planted milkweed plants all across uh, the, our border in our pastures. Okay, the next activity we did was nutrient management. Uh, you know, we wanted to make sure from a soil health perspective, uh, we do things that could uh, allow us to eliminate or reduce dependency on synthetic uh, fertilizer. So based up with this activity, you know, we all, we, we performed our soil testing, which we should always do. Uh, that we uh, applied lime, which was required in our area. That was one of the things with our pH level, we needed to apply lime. And the other uh, activity that I hadn't thought about was uh, the movement of our hay bales. So what they uh, instructed us to do is don't put all of your hay bales in, in, in the same area, move them around within your paddock. So that's gonna help increase the organic matter within your soil. Uh, so that was one of the items that we probably would not have done if we had not worked with our NRCS agent as, as part of that. So that was an area, this is one of those new fields. This was the uh, pasture land, I mean the uh, timber land that we converted to pasture land. So we had to do some soil, apply some uh, lime to this area to get, get it to where we wanted to get it at that, at that location. So I think we did like a thousand pounds per acre of, of lime to that pasture. This is one where uh, we, when we plant, put our hay bales out, we move them around. So we don't put them all in the same place. We just, uh, every time we put out a new hay bale for our animals, we move it around so that we don't have them all in the same area. So that helps build up the organic matter within our soil. Okay, and then integrated pest management, right? We wanna be able to control pests. Uh, we're in a great position on our farm as we do not have a lot of pests, but we wanna make sure we don't get pests. So we wanted to put this practice in place to make sure uh, that we can prevent uh, pests from uh, carrying. Um, one, of, one of the major pests in our air, area is armyworms. So that's something we're always on the, on the lookout for. So as part of this, integrated pest management strategy, uh, NRCS has something that they call a PAMS technique. It's prevention, avoidance, monitoring, and suppression. So that was like those four areas of activities that we do. We do that uh, almost on a monthly basis on our grazing land just to check for pests because even though we don't have them, we wanna make sure we do not get those pests. So we, we use they, their, their method, their PAMS method, to uh, monitor for pests, um, suppress pests, and avoid pests. And so things like basically, you know, when you're moving um, your tractor uh, equipment from one paddock to the other, make sure it's clean, you know, clean it off, you know. So you, you want to make sure you have an area where you can clean off your equipment before you move that, 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 that equipment to different areas. Uh, avoidance, you know, a healthy, a healthy pastor is one of your best ways of avoiding a uh, uh, pest. So make sure you do not overgraze your pastures, right? So being able to rotate the animals around gives us time to uh, allow that paddock to recover, uh, to rest, and then we can move the animals around. And that also allows us to go in and do maintenance on that, on, on that paddock if we need to. Uh, monitoring, always be on the lookout, you know, always go out in, into your uh, pasture and uh, check for uh, pests and things. Multi-species grazing also help because uh, some worms that may be detrimental to one animal, it may not be to the other animal. So multi-species grazing also help us in, in that a, a, a aspect as well. And then finally on the suppression, you know, if you have to do, uh, you know, we do uh, mechanical, and, and biological, but if you need to do chemical to control those pests, 
I work with the NRCS agent on, you know, what's the best chemicals uh, that's more appropriate for your area. So just some general tips uh, based on us. Again, like I say, uh, we are new, new and beginning farmers, uh, you know. So uh, like I said, we primarily started up full scale in 2019. Uh, definitely work with your agents. Uh, your local agent is there to provide support to you. Like work with those guys. They will be very beneficial to you as you're looking to put CSP plans in place. Uh, fortunately for us, um, our CSP plan was approved on the first try, but you know, it may take a few times, but don't, don't, don't get discouraged, continue to work uh, with your agent to see what's there. But ours was approved uh, uh, readily. Uh, so we was great in that, in that, uh, at that. Once approved, documentation is very important. You know, keep uh, thorough documentation of the activities that you are performing uh, in, to monitor what you're doing. Uh, take pictures, you know, keep your receipts, uh, document everything, because during COVID, we were able to do a lot of self-certification. You know, if, if you send in enough documentation to your agent, they, they know that you're actually doing what you're supposed to be doing. So you may be able to self-certify. If not, you know, no, no big deal. You know, your agent may visit your form. And I always like for the agent to come out and visit my form anyhow, because that's a time for me to talk about talk with them about other things that we can be doing, uh, other conservation activities. But I'll keep, keep, your, keep your receipts, your inventory and all of that stuff in support of the practice that you are implementing. Commun regularly, communicate regularly with your agent, you know, send them emails, send pictures, go out and talk with those guys so that they know what you're doing. If you're doing field days or tours at your firm, invite them out, you know, make them part of what you're doing. Uh, that also advocates for others who may be somewhat on the fence line about implementing these practices, if they see what you're doing and what the agents are doing to help you out, they, be, they may be more adept uh, to going in and asking for help as well. And the last one I want to say is don't be afraid to explore and implement new practices. Uh, I just showed you a few of the practices and activities that are out there in CSP there's an awful lot of uh, activities that can be implemented under the conservation stewardship program. Uh, they have a great website that has all of the documentation. So I would say, don't be afraid to look at some of those newer practices as well. In nrcs.usda.gov, I mean, I, I, I keep that bookmark because I'm also always looking at what's the next thing that we're going to be looking at implementing uh, on the form. You know, our practices, uh, the practices we currently have are for five years, uh, but I want to do some proactive planning. So, so what's going to be the next practice that we can look at uh, implementing out here on Mystery Farm? So, that website has an uh, awful lot of information that was very beneficial. And not only just uh, pastoral land, like say, even for timberland, we have CSP contracts on our timberland as well. So I look for things that we can also implement on our timberland. Yes, and if I can just add a few things before we go to questions. Uh, you know, we talked a lot about CSP and not much about EQIP. Uh, EQIP. EQIP is based on a ranking factor, uh, based on how many uh, natural resources concerns you actually have on the property. In our area, it's 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 tough for smaller farmers because we're in a dairy, we're in dairy country, and right now in Louisiana, dairies have a lot of issues. So. Uh, to make it simple, they're going to have more resource concern than us on their property right now. But we were able to use CSP uh, in place of EQIP on our farm. Uh, we were able to do a lot of things that we wanted to do with EQIP with the CSP. Uh, you know, we, we try to keep our property in good shape. One of the things we had to do when we started this property. Uh, the nutrient value was really, really low. So the first thing we had to do was bring that pH up. And we had a pH of 4.8. So the first year, 
you know, it was recommended we, had, we, we, we apply two tons of lime per acre. Well, <clears throat> that's a lot of lime to apply at one time. So the first year we applied one ton of, uh, of, of lime and 80 pounds of uh, ammonia nitrate uh, to begin the pasture in the seeding process. Uh, pull the soil test the next year, uh, the, the pH was coming up. So we added another ton of, of, uh, of, of lime and now we had a pH of 5.9. Uh, so this year we didn't add any, uh, any more lime and we didn't add any fertilizer this year. So we are just using the, the manure and the urine from the cows and the animals uh, to sustain our pasture. Uh, we may have to add later, later on and we probably will. We don't cut any hay. So most of the nutrients pass through the cows and go back to the pasture. But uh, CSP has been uh, very important to us in, uh, in doing some of these practices, both on the, on, the, on, the, on the grazing land and on the timberland. Uh, one of the things we did on our timberland, I know we're talking about grazing, but this year we planted uh, 500 native fruit trees. Uh, to attract wildlife to those uh, forested areas. So, but yeah, I recommend most of the farmers in our areas, in our area to use CSP as, as an, uh, an alternative to equip. Just wanted to throw that in. Mm -hmm. and, and just one more thing, cause I know Jamie said, for us, we did get an equip contract on our what, timberland to plant longleaf trees. And because we planted long leaves, uh, NRCS paid 100% of that for us. So uh, they, did, they, they purchased all of the trees, all of the prep work, and they maintained that for five years. So we did not have to come out of pocket with any dollars to do that. So, so yeah. use, use those programs. They're out there. Feel free to use them. Did you want to do questions now or at the end, uh, Jamie? Sure. Let's see if anyone has questions specific for you both now. Um, and I know I have a, a couple questions I can save for the very end. Okay. Hi, I'm Amelia with Tamilia Farms in Latson, South Carolina. I was wondering uh, when you say uh, that they allowed you to, uh, they, they gave you the tree seedlings to plant on your, did you have to have a certain amount of acres for them to give you that to uh, maintain? And did they buy the trees from you or did you, were you able to sell the longleaf pines? No, for yourself? When, when, we, when we bought the property, it was clear cut, okay? So we signed up for an EQIP contract under the Long Leaf Pine Initiative. Uh, so under the Long Leaf Pine Initiative, uh, they did the site prep, planted the trees, and they are helping with the management of it, you know, uh, control burns. Uh, and they've done that for the last five years. So, but it's, yeah, it was under the Long Leaf Pine initiative, equip. So they pretty much done everything to get the, uh, to help you get the crop established. And we also have another question uh, from Trini's Holden. It says, can you speak more about the long leaf for CSP? Is that only in certain states? No, it's, it's, in, it's in every state. Uh, it, it's, it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, long leaf pine. Uh, we have both long leaf and lob lob uh, stands, and they are both in CSP. Uh, from our experience, there's an advantage uh, program wise with long leaf pine through the long leaf pine initiative because there's a separate pot of money for the longleaf pine, trying to establish longleaf pine in our area. Uh, we also have 
uh, Loblolly Pine, and we, we have had equip contracts on the Loblolly Pine uh, to in, in control uh, uh, other species of trees. But, uh, you know, uh, Loblolly, Longly, under the Longleaf Initiative, we've, had, we've had been able to do a lot more things. Uh, just this past winter, was it this past winter, we put in a low water crossing? Yes, yes, and that was another equip contract. Uh, we needed to be able to get around our property and where we planted those longleaf pines, there was some, there was an area that was really impassable when it rained. So uh, again, working with NRCS, uh, they came out and took a, a look and they said, okay, yeah, this is a place that you need to put in a low water crossing. And basically that's just a concrete structure that they uh, put in that when it rains, the water goes over it, but it's drivable. You can drive your vehicle over that piece. So and that again, that was an equip contract again that we use from NRCS to allow us to do that, to allow us to be able to cross our property, get across that property. They that was an equip contract. Yeah, and the thing with equip and CSP, you, you can't duplicate the practices under both programs. Okay. So if you're doing something under equip, most times you're not going to qualify right off. For CSP, but once that equip contract is done and you're maintaining it, it's my understanding that you can file for CSP under, under that on that same track. I know the rest of the stuff we can use during the summer. So yeah, okay, thanks, Carol. Okay, bye. Those are good questions. Um, the water crossing is a popular reason for farmers to seek out NRCS assistance um, or their local soil and water district assistance, um, which also has a cost share program. Um, another really popular one to kind of change and manage um, your livestock's access to water bodies or um, seasonal flows or drainages is like access control. Um, sometimes these are the unique situations in which NRCS would uh, cost share some fencing in order to exclude livestock from those water bodies out of concern for soil health, water health, and the livestock health. Um, so that they're not you know, drinking water with their own waste, so that they're trampling up to the creek edges, it's not causing further erosion. Um, and compromising water quality. Um, you know, that, that might be something um, that our NRCS representative, William um, Byron, can speak to when he reviews Silva pasture as well. So we'll welcome um, Mr. Byron to add anything to these questions and answers too. Um, Trinice, I'm going to hold your second question for the end Q&A, just so that we make sure William has his presentation time now. So uh, we're going to move to William's portion, which is going to be a deep dive into a single NRCS practice, which is silvopasture, um, and also the practices that might complement the silvopasture practice. Okay, great, thanks. It's going. Everybody seeing the screen? Yes, perfect, thanks. Okay, like my name is William Byron and I am the East National Tech Center uh, Forester and located in Greensboro, North Carolina. And I cover uh, the Eastern part of the nation from uh, Maine down to Florida and Puerto Rico, um, just as a, like a technical contact for forestry issues for the states. <clears throat> so I, I usually deal with like the people in your state, mostly just if your state has a forester or maybe somebody at their state office. <clears throat> so just let you know kind of about my, my job. Um, so we put together this, this presentation about civil pasture just to kind of we were getting a lot of questions about it, and we wanted to let people know about what civil pasture was and what it's not. So put a put a um, put together a little slideshow here, and, and 
it'll go fairly quickly, but um, and I definitely want to get um, save time at the end for any questions you might have about about summer pasture or any other questions like you asked uh, the Muse brothers. Um, if you have any specific questions, I can probably answer. I was a district conservationist for about ten years, so so I lived them on that side as well. So <clears throat> anyway, I'll get started. So this is kind of what the outline of what we'll go through today, uh, the definition, what does it look like, give some examples, talk about the benefits, maybe some requirements, and then just show some steps to get to a typical silver pasture system, um, and then the resource concerns that silver pasture can help with. <clears throat> So every every practice we have has a standard, um, and it kind of gives you the definition and what the purposes are, and then what you have to do to meet the that um, the criteria for that purpose. <clears throat> so the definition of silver pasture as it stands right now um, is the establishment and or management of desired trees and, and forages on the same land unit. So what we're trying to manage is the forage of trees and the livestock on the same um, land unit <clears throat> is, is what we're calling silver pasture. And it's the intensive management of those, those three items. And then um, within silver pasture, one of the criteria is, is prescribed grazing. Um, so like the Muse, Muse Brothers were doing their, their rotational grazing, their property. Um, they were, they would be really good candidates um, for for silver pasture if they decided to go that route. <clears throat> um, and and it's not some people confuse silver pasture with just like letting your cattle into the woods. You know that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to maintain that those three items where we're we're managing for the forage, the livestock, and and the trees. <clears throat> All right, so I'll get, I'm gonna just throw some pictures up here. Um, and we'll just say, what does, what does silver pasture look like? Um, so when I look at these, and I know these pictures, they can't tell the whole story, but just when you see that picture, do you think that is good management of all three of those components? Do you think that the animals look good? Do you think the pasture is being managed? And do you, do, do you think the trees, or being managed as well. <clears throat> so just to kind of give you a visual of like just some ideas of what silver pasture might look like. <clears throat> so do you think this looks like good silver pasture system? So to me, when I look at it, the animals look healthy. I see grass, you know, I don't see any bare spots and the trees look like they're healthy. So I'm gonna say yes on this one. So when I look at this picture, do I see I see a uh, some um, a high, high tensile wire there, this this separating. So there's probably some rotational grazing going on. Uh, the cows look pretty healthy. Uh, I don't see any issues with any of the trees. I guess this one right here is dying a little bit. I don't know. If you probably can't see my cursor, <laughs> mm -hmm. but um, one of them looks like it might be dying a little bit. But the grass looks looks well, they're not overgrazing. So I'm gonna say yes to this one as well. <clears throat> so when I look at this one, do I think this is silver pasture? You know, you have cows out there, they look healthy. Um, I don't see much forage for them to eat off of and it doesn't like the, the trees are really being managed for any kind of, um, whether it's timber or non-forested product. So on this one, I'll say no. I don't. This would this. I would just looking at this one picture. I wouldn't say this was a silver pasture system. This is more just letting your cows in the woods to give them some shade or um, something like that. Uh, what about this picture? So this one can be a little bit confusing because okay, we have we have the cattle out there. They're loafing in one area, but the but the grazing. I mean, the grass looks pretty good in this picture. I see a few trees. Um, so do we, will we call this silver pasture? No, just because we're not managing these trees really for any kind of production, intense production of, of, uh, 
of timber or any kind of non forested product. <clears throat> And then here, I guess you guys are probably getting the, getting the idea of what we're just kind of doing here. So I would say no to this one as well, just because I don't see any kind of forage down here that's being managed. This looks like more of a loafing area um, for the cattle. Um, no, I wouldn't say this was, there's a pig in there, I think, um, if you look close enough, but I don't, this isn't really, this, this forage is, I mean, the forest is not being managed at all. Um, and we don't see any kind of forage for the animals to eat. And then we also have a note on this one just for the same thing. Um, nothing, nothing to eat here. So why why not? Is because you know, like we've like I probably stated overstated too much, but um, I think it's very important to try to get through um, that we have to be intensely managing all three of these these things. Uh, here, the next few slides are just some uh, pictures of some silvo pasture systems. Uh, typically, we think about pine systems in the southeast with grasses, but we try to find some other ones that were going on maybe in the north or other kind of species, just, just to get you thinking outside of the, the normal box of longleaf or live like pine. <clears throat> So in your left picture, there's a, this is a 20 year old black butte locust stand. Um, it was established from open field. It's been thinned twice. <clears throat> uh, it's been the, when it's commercially thin, the locust has been used for fence posts and they're, they're grazing beef cattle on it. Um, over here is kind of the same, it's a oak and maple silver pasture system converted from a forest. So they went in and did a thinning uh, to get more sunlight to the ground so they could get some forages to grow. Um, it's really not in rows or anything like that. It's irregularly shaped. Um, so that's to then um, the picture on the left is black walnut, um, 60, 80 years. Uh, those trees aren't 60, 80 years old, but that's probably the, um, the life, the, the mature, They'll mature around 60 to 80 years to get some nut production, can serve as a, an additional annual crop. And then here's one of your typical ones with the long leaf, the lava eye pine, um, and they have goats grazing in there. Here's some eastern white pine and some cool season grasses, and it's being grazed by dairy goats and beef cattle. Uh, this one on the right is pretty unique. It's um, it's hazelnuts that provide shade and cover for poultry. Um, and then some of the, um, the nuts can serve as a, a food source for the poultry as well. Apple orchard, I mean, that, that um, you had to think about some other things if you're gonna have any kind of human consumption when you allow cattle uh, or livestock to, to um, have their manure and things, um, especially if it's an organic type of orchard, there would be other food safety rules you would need to follow and be aware of. So just to make you aware of that. And then um, <clears throat> this can be everywhere, but it, this is uh, that picture I showed you earlier was a Christmas tree producer and then they were grazing sheep within the Christmas trees. So here's a list of um, some of the benefits, you know, top benefits we see is shade for livestock because we all know cattle or livestock can get stress from the sun. Um, it gives you kind of diverse uh, income. Um, a lot of people talked about the aesthetic value of having trees on your farm or uh, the ability to, with all the talk about climate change, the ability to, um, <clears throat> to sequester more carbon with, with growing trees in a pasture situation. Um, increasing timber uh, value or yield, being able to harvest those trees that are in that silviculture system as that system matures. Uh, more hunting value, you know, you have a, a better habitat for wildlife when you have trees in your pasture.
So, um, you know, how does silver culture affect, silver pasture affect foraging cattle? You, uh, you have lower density stands permit enough sunlight to get to the forest floor so that you can get that that forage growth um, so that cattle so, so that cattle can um, soon can harvest that that grass. Some challenges that you might run across in silver pasture, you know, it's not easy. You know, it's not for everybody. Um, if, if you're not doing a good job at managing your pasture now with rotational grazing, then maybe you should get that um, under control before you try to jump into silver pasture. Um, I, it's it's got to be the right person, have the right site. Um, and I think being a good manager or um, is, is really key key to that. Uh, silver, silver pasture systems change over time. So when you first plant the trees, you would have to protect them kind of like in this picture here, either with a fence around the tree itself or maybe not letting the cattle get into that paddock until the trees get large enough where they can't eat, eat that um, top bowl of that tree. And then how are you gonna regenerate that forest in the long run? Um, and then there may be some tax benefits or some tax issues that you might have or land use programs um, around your taxes that you had to think about before you converted to a silver pasture um, system. And I kind of touched on this already, but manager requirements, um, you know, comfortable with rotational grazing, um, you have time to move the animals around. You're comfortable working with a system that changes. Um, you have a team, you have a forester with knowledge of grazing, or you have a grazing specialist that understands a little bit about forestry. You know, you need to find somebody you can count on it in NRCS or your local extension agent should be able to help you. And just talking about a little bit about your site, you know, how, is your site capable of grow crops and timber? Is your can you access all the paddocks? Can you, is your property fenceable? Where you can get your water from? You know, some of the things that the Muse brothers kind of already talked about, you know, you got to have water for your cattle to, to be able to get to. So how are you going to plan that out? A couple of paths, different paths to silver pasture. You know, you're either going to plant the trees in the, in the open area or you're going to thin your forest to try to allow sunlight to get to the to the floor. So if you're going to plant the trees, these are just some common steps. Um, get your team of professionals. Take a look at the site. You know what do you want to do as a uh, the landowner? Are you trying to get more shade? What kind of products do you want to get out of your trees? Um, where where is the sunlight? You know, are you going to run your rows of trees east to west <clears throat> so you can get the maximum amount of sunlight to the ground for your forages? I uh, kind of just threw this one up here just so you can see some of the different types of um, site prep. You know, this is um, if you have a compacted soil layer, you'll need to run um, uh, this first picture, the top left is a is a shank that comes down and kind of breaks up that compacted layer. Then you would come back and paint your trees, you know, disking, spraying, scalping the, the soil. Um, you, it's really important to control that competition uh, around those trees that you're planting, especially in the grass. And, um, if you're in an old pasture or something like that, because the, the grass can kill, um, kill the trees. Talked a little bit about road orientation. Um, you just want to try to maximize the sunlight that you get. It doesn't necessarily be the east to west, but you just want to consider that when you're when you're when you're planning out your your system with your um, agent. Containerized seedlings. We we would always probably suggest you go that route if you can because they are they typically um, they might be a little bit more expensive, but they have a better survival rate. And then kind of the same steps when you're you're going through canopy management, um, gather your team, assess the site. You want to leave what trees you want to leave uh, 
and not harvest, uh, pick good quality trees that are producing, you know, um, if, if you're getting something nut producing or something like that, you want to make sure you leave your biggest and best trees out there. And then think about the timing of when you do do the thinning. Um, you don't want to do it when it's wet, you know, so you don't want to rub up your site. You don't want to do it during the wrong time of the year. And there's some, um, I don't know if you know, but there's a National Agroforestry Center that's made up of the U.S. Forest Service and NRCS jointly. They have a lot of, um, they have a lot of documents uh, around silvopasture and just trying to help you um, learn more, some other resources out there. We talk about the canopy management. We're talking about trying to get that sunlight to the ground. So this is a little instrument um, that maybe your NRCS person has to kind of gauge how much light is getting to the forest floor. So you know how much, what kind of maybe species of cool season or warm season forage you could plant um, underneath your forest. But management is a must. I think this is a good picture that um, the right side of this picture has been, has been, um, they did a soil test and they fertilized it and then and had to get some of the pine straw off of it, whereas the left side was left unmanaged. And you can kind of see the difference in the, the forage that is available there. So in going, going from a forest to, to a silver pasture system, these are some of the these are probably some of the common steps. You know, you're thinning your trees out to get more sunlight. You might have to prune those limbs on some of those trees to again get more sunlight. What do you do with that the extra debris? You know, you might might burn it if you're able to burn it, or you might do some kind of woody residue treatment to try to get rid of that um, that um, fluff or the forest floor so that the grasses can grow. Then you might have to do some kind of disking or spraying or add a little bit of lime or something to try to get that um, understory herbicide, I mean, not herbicide, herbaceous layer to grow. This is just another side about the 50% <clears throat> light of, for cool season grasses. And if you're going to grow warm season grasses, they probably need about 75% sunlight. Uh, this is a slide just showing some of the um, cool season grasses and legumes. And this is showing like the, your shade tolerance, so how much sun they would need um, or not need for um, to be able to grow. And this is the same type of chart for your uh, native warm season grasses. And I'm sure if you want a copy of, of this that you could look at later um, and get, get you a copy of, of the slide set. So William, we will need to move to question and answers. Yep. Um, oh, but that's a great map. Um, your, your deck is, you know, clearly so th thorough and informative. Yeah, I, I think there's three more slides, so I'll just okay. I'll just hit it real quick. Um, okay. Sorry, I've taken so long. That's um, okay. These are just some other management activities. You know, you need to think about your your pine straw. You know, you need to be able to be able to get that up or manage it somehow. Um, this I'm just showing that not all states always offer silver pasture. So this is at the national level we have it available, and then the states can. Um, they decide what practices they offer or don't offer based on their priorities. So some states don't offer silver pasture. A lot of states offer silver pasture where they're planting trees like in pasture, but they don't offer where you can convert from a forest to a silver pasture system. So you would need to go to your local agent or local state to find out exactly what they could offer you in your state. <clears throat> And then these are just the resource concerns that are tied to silver pasture. Um, you know, you're improving your air quality and um, your livestock production. You know, you're getting them some shade and things like that. So, 
So my last slide right here is just additional resources. Again, most of them, a lot of them come from the National Agroforestry Center. Um, so it's a great, a great resource. So, and sorry, so sorry I took so long, but yeah, I'm open to any questions um, about NRCS. Let's open it up. You can also put your questions on the chat, share it with us if, if you'd like. And I do have some questions, but I wanna hold space for others. I'm famous for peppering folks with questions. Question. Tell me about because uh, I looked on the Google it and I saw the silver patch, but it says you have to have like two hundred acres of land. Jesus Christ, people! I don't have two hundred acres of land. <laughs> How am I gonna? I mean, I've got a couple acres and that could utilize this program. I mean, does it really have to be two hundred acres? That's that's one my question. I really won't take that. Yeah, not to my knowledge. I mean, none of our practices have a requirement, acres requirement. So I don't know. Um, I mean, you can send me what you found, but I, that doesn't sound sound accurate. Mm -hmm. It's important to note, um, you know, what William just said, there is no minimum acreage. Um, what is necessary for NRCS to partner with your farmland is that there are resource concerns or challenges evident in the landscape and that they have a way of treating those challenges. And that's what a conservation practice is. And Silva pasture is one of these practices, number, uh, I think it was 381 is the code for that practice. Um, but Silva pasture is also kind of like a widely uh, practice topic outside of NRCS. So if you if you do like Google um, rotational grazing silva pasture, you're going to get a lot of different information. Um, and you can certainly practice silva pasture without NRCS assistance, but NRCS does bring financial resources to help you get it established or to better manage those sites that you're attempting it in. Um, I had a question um, related to silva pasture, William. So if you're establishing trees and shrubs in a pasture, um, then will you need to eventually get a forest management plan from NRCS? Um, if the, the equip policy states that you have to have a forestry management plan, if you're doing forestry practices on forest land, Okay. So you necessarily, if you're doing it from pasture to to silver pasture, technically you would not have to have a forestry management plan um, to start with. But as I guess as that uh, turns into a, a full blown silver pasture system, you might want to get one just to help you um, manage manage your your system. Okay. And there's some there's some talk about that. You know whether you get a a gray a grazing plan. Um, or whether you would get a forestry management plan. So some of that stuff still being talked about, but okay. to start with, you would not have to have one. And then if you're starting on the opposite side from that woodland or forest, you're saying you have to have a forest management plan, and that's a policy of the EQUIP program before you apply for silver pasture, can, can you apply for both at the same time? Or how does this affect the farmer's kind of timeline for getting financial support specifically for silver pasture? Yeah, so I think if, if, we're, if we're following the equip policy, they would need to have a forestry management plan to be able to go in and do the thinning to make sure we were taking out the right trees and not messing up any other kind of resource concerns. Um, then we would need them to get a forestry management plan. 
there's a couple ways you can do that. You can go out and get your own forester and get them to write you a forestry management plan and then bring that into your NRCS office, which I think that's kind of how it's handled a lot. Um, if you do not have a forester, we do have um, where you can get a plan written through EQIP um, and we can pay you, pay you to pay that TSP uh, technical service provider to write you a plan. Going that route tends to delay you an extra year because then you, you're applying for EQIP to get a plan written. And then after you get the plan written, you would come in the next year to kind of apply for those activities that you want to do. Okay. Meaning NRCS cannot process both of these at once. They would have to have that force management ap plan application. Yes. Or you would have to have that management plan already in place from an outside entity. Yes, yes. Okay, which the Forest Service can provide free of charge yes. themselves directly. Mm -hmm. in, most, in most states, I, I think that would be correct. I can tell you in Louisiana, I use the state forestry service there during my forestry management plan. Okay, that's good advice because this question about like, how does this actually delay the farmer's timeline um, can come as quite a surprise. And it happened to me personally on my farm and forested land. You know, we didn't get anywhere with the practices we were seeking out because we didn't know we had to have that forest management plan in place yeah. first. So we're yeah. starting there. Yeah. And ecologically, like that's important because the forest management plan is going to give us like the most holistic picture of how to manage our woodlands well. I wanted to circle back to um, Ms. Holden's question um, to the Muse Brothers. How did you get the ponds approved and the creek? Okay, so first of all, the creek, the creek is a natural creek. It was, it, was, it was here long before we were here. So we just incorporate our pastors around the creek. So there's nothing we could do about the creek. It was, it was, it was here. Uh, we have not gotten a pond approved under EQIP or CSP yet because the, the land that we purchased had ponds already in place. Uh, we built one new pond when we built our homes here. And I can tell you, uh, we, we did not go through the plot process because of timing. Uh, we needed to build our homes. The guy said, it's the perfect time to get the dirt. He said, I can build you the pond to get the dirt. So we didn't even try to get an equip contract for that. But I do have an equip contract and now an active equip contract. What I'm trying to get is a solo well because I want to be able to be pretty much independent of any um, government water system. So if I can get a solo well, uh, that helps me out in Louisiana. You know, we have hurricanes and storms. Hurricane Ida, we lost our water, our city water for 12 days. So we're looking more to work with those guys to, to uh, implement a solar well system to uh, provide water for our farm. Does that answer the question? Yes, if I may add a few things. Uh, typically, NRCS will not approve a pond for livestock uh, watering system. Uh, we, we, we do have some pond. Like Chris say, one of, one of the ponds is already on the property when we bought it. Uh, we did build a pond, but it didn't, it wasn't too equipped or in our CS. It was the fact that we needed some field dirt for house pads, and there was an area that was a gully. We, we're in the rolling hills, so that was a gully. So uh, we were able to prepare that gully uh, with a pond. So that's how we ended up with a pond there, but it wasn't too equipped. And that's out of NRCS's concern to not create probably further resource concerns down the road with animals getting access to that, that pond and kind of creating more natural ecosystem issues down, down the road. All right. And let me add that we do have uh, water troughs. <clears throat> so we're not totally dependent on the pond for water sources for our cows. We do have fresh water. Well, out of respect for everyone's time, we're going to share the last few slides of the PowerPoint, which are just resources and next steps for farmers to take. 
And then we're going to stay on. And if anyone has, you know, lingering questions and if our presenters are willing to stay on, um, but Carolina and I at least will stay on for um, any further questions when we end with a brief three question evaluation via a poll. Um, so for, for what's next, um, we want to share how to find your NRCS contact. Um, if you've never made contact with NRCS before, you can find, and if, uh, Carolina, you go to the next slide, um, that you can find this um, link here in the chat now. Um, and to take this a, a step further on the next slide, you'll see NRCS's five steps to assistance. So this is kind of the order in which NRCS wants to assist farmers. And what Rafi does is we help farmers prepare before you start at step one with NRCS. So we can talk to you on kind of a one-to-one -one basis about your, your farm and what your farm aspirations are, as well as help you kind of hone in on what these quote unquote resource concerns are so that when you go to NRCS, you're already kind of speaking their language. And um, if it's appropriate, um, even identifying some of the conservation practices that might assist with the concerns or challenges you have. And we're finding that for farmers who are already very conservation minded, this um, technical assistance that we offer for free and on a one-on-one -on -one basis helps a lot of these conservation farmers um, kind of figure out what are my resource concerns? Because when I look out there, like nothing's really glaring, but I've heard that Equip can help me with cross fencing, or I've heard that Equip can help me get more water troughs. So we help you kind of connect the dots and navigate the, the program and then walk you through um, the application and overall, um, we want to have a really good and healthy working relationship between farmer, NRCS local agent, and NRCS as a whole. So you can begin by taking a picture um, of this QR code on the screen. That will take you to Rafi's conservation assessment, will, which will ask you a series of questions related to the conservation efforts you've done or want to do on your farm and any experience you have with NRCS to date. And then um, our staff receive your assessment results and then we would be in contact with you uh, to begin one-on-one -on -one assistance for you and your farm. A couple of other resources, and I saw some mentioned in other parts of the slides. Um, the Food Animal Concerns Trust, or FACT, has a wonderful series of webinars. And actually there's a FACT staff member on this call so a shout out to y'all, um, but their webinars, um, which I'm going to put this link in the chat now, um, are fantastic and I can't recommend them enough. They've nearly convinced me to have sheep. Um, and then the Livestock Conservancy has a series of micro grants available now to farmers that have heritage breed animals. Um, and um, some of you, that might apply. And these grants are also open to farmers in the territories. And I put that link in the chat now as well. So this is Carolina and I's contact information. We'll leave this on the screen and we're gonna launch a three question poll via Zoom. So it's gonna appear on your screen next. And then anyone with further questions can stay on the call and Carolina and I at least will hang out here. Thanks everyone so much. Thanks, Jamie. And um, yes, Rose, we will share the presentations and a link to the recording as soon as we get that uploaded to our YouTube site. Thanks for asking.
Thank you so much for those who have uh, answered our, our evaluation. It really helps us improve and design a always better, better webinars. And I think we have good answers here. So yes, if mm, any one of you had any other questions, I think we can we can close up. What do you think, Jane? Sounds good. So last call for any questions and we'll say goodbye. Mm -hmm.